Hello, and welcome back to Full Frontal Philosophy, where we are still talking about talking. So the, uh, the things we've talked about so far, Platonism, nominalism, scientific realism, all of the ideas for a foundation of what it means and how communication works, they all assume fundamentally that language works, that communication just, it works. And the assumption is that it must be based on some foundation because you know, everything that works must have a reason for working. So in general, what you, what you see is in text is um, examples of functional communication and then trying to break down why that works. So for example, the communication that a red house is red, um, saying if I say, this house is whatever color it is, uh, red, this is a red house, and we agree that it's a red house, or we measure its redness through some scientific measuring technique of the wavelengths of the light coming off it, or we believe that there is some fundamental red quality. Either way, it works to say it's red. But that doesn't really get us anywhere. If we just assume that it works, then we can kind of make up whatever basis we want and say, well, it works because of this. So it might be more helpful to look at what happens when it doesn't work. And to be honest, mostly language doesn't work. Mostly it doesn't say anything. Um, most language is either trivial or gossip or meaningless. And for the most part, we accept that that's the way language works, that we don't expect people to say things that matter. Um, when we turn the TV on, whatever it is, um, the expectation is that we will get trivia. And there are you know, more specific examples of when it, it breaks down completely, like um, if you've ever watched Trump, Donald Trump speak, or um, if you were watching the Brexit uh, Brexit rallies, um, Boris Johnson, uh, Vladimir Putin, his speeches, um, climate denial. Um, and it's easy to say, well, those guys are lying, right? Like Trump is a liar. Um, but it's kind of beside the point. Like none of the people in his audience, nobody listening to Boris Johnson either, or Putin for that matter, care one bit whether what they're saying is true in a factual sense. It has a different kind of truth, but that's not something that you could communicate using the sort of techniques of language. Even knowing what it is that's being communicated is very hard because I don't think most of the people who are listening to those types of communications are particularly interested in what is actually true about them. And so there are times like that where the language isn't just trivial, it's, it's somehow ironic and deliberately uh, not factually true, um, but communicating something else entirely. Or not communicating anything, which is also possible um, in a very deliberate way. <laughs> so, um, but we see this even in discussions of the foundations of language. So, uh, for example, nominalists, in order to believe that there is an agreement as to what words mean or how we can use them, nominalists generally have to assume that there's some foundation, some found fundamental words or hinges on which everything else can be built. And those hinges have sort of mysterious origins or they come from nowhere. Um, and actually, they end up... Uh, as, as one commentator said, it is as, as if, as though the nominalist is preaching the need to avoid sin by not being a Platonist, but at the same time demonstrating that the only route to being a non-sinner is by first being a wicked sinner. So first you need to believe in Platonism in order to get some agreement off the ground as to what anything means. And this is pretty consistent, like um, when you ask anyone whether it's a scientist or a philosopher or a linguist, you know, about the foundations of their practice, they tend to talk about it as in the same way that, that priests talk about sex. 
So if you ask, or if, if, if you ask scientists about entropy in particular, and we're gonna to get to entropy a lot more later on, um, it's very much the way Catholics talk about sex. It's something you should definitely not do and definitely not talk about unless it's necessary, in which case you should have as much of it as possible or as much of it as necessary to have as many babies as possible. So there's a recognition somewhere back there that entropy is fundamental and that there is some fundamental uh, mysterious thing, but we're not allowed to talk about it openly. And we should definitely not do it unless we have to. As a practical matter, people use whatever model of language is most uh, convenient for the situation. So in spiritual matters, people tend to adopt the sort of Platonist perspective that uh, the foundations of, of language are ineffable and beyond question. So the notion of God, the notion of spirit, all of these things have a fundamental meaning that, that, that you don't even have to question. Um, at work, people will tend to use a realist perspective, like whatever is, you know, uh, functional and uh, obvious and practical and material, that's taken to be real and communicable. And then in sort of political or um, aesthetic matters, people are very nominalist. You, you kind of agree with your tribe as to what is good and real. But there are certain problems that arise if we just kind of give away the space to a kind of agreement or um, even if that agreement is that it's is a, a platonic agreement or a scientific agreement, um, at, at the end, at the end of the day, those because neither scientific realism nor Platonism have any sort of fundamental basis, they also come back to an agreement between in members of a group, a social group, and those members agree on what constitutes science or what constitutes the foundations for. Of, of platonic uh, idealism, so whatever the ideals are. Um, and that agreement sort of opens us up to the paradoxes and inconsistencies of any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, situation where people, different people have different levels of power. Um, So one of the things that's pretty clear in a Trump rally, for example, is that the social meaning of the language that as, as sort of agreed upon is, is sort of disconnected from any kind of reality or even consistency. So we have a kind of set of, of social tokens, language tokens that can be used pro-socially within the group, but also anti-socially uh, against anyone who's outside of the group. So all of these things um, can be, in a sense, have two meanings, both the, the in-group meaning. Um, so for example, any given conspiracy theory, um, the uh, typical Rothschild control of uh, whatever economics or Soros in control of the Democratic Party. It has one meaning for the in-group, which is uh, just that we are uh, against those people, um, but has no, uh, uh, also it is seen as dangerous by the people outside of the group. So any kind of rational, uh, r rational group of people would say that's that's wrong and obviously misleading and um, offensive. So 
So one of the places we see this in particular is sort of um, the way people begin to manipulate their language or manipulate the, the identity, both their identity and the group identity within a particular group of people. So once mythologies are decoupled from the physical constraints of facts, they can be, be manipulated to highlight the differences between group members and outsiders. And statements that are true, sorry, say, statements can be true representations of social identity, um, even if they are false represent, representations of physical identity. Um, a real, like, a good example is um, Paul Ryan, uh, the, he was the vice presidential nominee for uh, 2012, and he told a story, oh, he, uh, he was asked about running, and uh, somebody on a radio show asked him about his running habits, and he said he doesn't run marathons anymore, and the announcer asked him, well, what's his personal best in the marathon, and, and Paul Ryan said a little bit below three hours. Now, a three-hour marathon is incredibly hard. Less than 3% of finishers in marathons run under three hours. So this is an incredibly difficult thing to do. The truth is that Paul Ryan ran a marathon in just over four hours, which is also impressive because running a marathon is impressive, but not like running it in three hours. So the question is, why didn't that matter? And what was he doing? What was he thinking? This is the sort of information that's verifiable. It's very fact-based. Uh, three hours is a marker. Like you, you either ran it in less than three hours or more. And he said he ran it in less than three hours. It's not something that's like the biggest fish in the lake or <laughs> uh, anything else like that. The um, so my understanding is he's saying that he is a dominant person and a dominant person should run a marathon in a low time, the kind of time that dominant people run it in. He didn't really care uh, about the truth and his followers, the people who are following that kind of person, also don't care about the facts. They care about the fact that a dominant person should have a dominant story. And if you look at Donald Trump's storytelling in particular, you see that all of his stories are about him being a dominant type of person. And if you look at the way the Fox News room degenerates over and over in the same kind of misogyny, even though you get like Roger Ailes being ousted, you have um, a number of commentators being uh, uh, having to pay um, large amounts of money, the culture of misogyny returns. And a big part of that is that those men who see themselves as dominant feel the need to project dominance by behaving badly. And that's a bigger issue than just truth versus falsehood. There's a deeper sense of the way the language breaks down here. And we'll get into that later. So thank you for today.